background. Okay. Hello, Eiko. It's so good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for being with me tonight. Yes, and we probably should introduce ourselves um, so that those yes. who watch us know who, who they're listening to, of course. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, I'll go first. I'm yes. a, a professor at um, Colorado College in dance. My name is Sean Womack, and I have the wonderful pleasure of having a conversation tonight with Eiko, who uh, I've known for ma um, many years through her work, but not personally, but in the last 10 years personally, because Eiko comes and teaches um, every other year in our dance program at Colorado College. Yes, thank you. And yes, indeed, Sean invited me, started to invite me to teach. And we, you know, yes, actually we start, you know, yesterday night we are talking how it's been a long time now. And so it also means every time I come, I have a conversation with you a number of the times, you know, we see each other in the office. So during this pandemic and uh, Zoom teaching, I, I really needed <laughs> to be with you mm -hmm. so that we keep our, you know, tradition, right? So my name is Eiko um, Otake. Not many people know my last name because for so many years I worked as Eiko and Koma. So uh, Koma is my partner for 40 some years. But since 2014, I have begun my own project. So I kind of became a soloist, so as a Koma. But the first time we came to Colorado College was Eiko and Koma's work, and so the second time. But since then, all my coming has been my solo artist. And I'm not a professor, but I am happy to be an instructor of a class that I teach. And it is, uh, it is uh, hilarious and kind of unusual at the same time, um, very humane class. And I seek for the ways how the young people and myself together can collectively learn. Um, and it, I deal with a massive violence of the history and at the same time of body and how each people as a class and, and together uh, separately uh, can encounter. So I have also been doing the jet project and I was talking to Sean yesterday night mm -hmm. and much the same way, Sean and I can be just like superficially friends, you know, because our work encounter. But I think Sean and I both do much more than happen to be acquaintance, happen to be friendly. So there's a line where like acquaintance becomes friends because we invest into the relationship, right? And I thank Sean not only having hosted my residencies and have given me a, a teaching opportunity, which I take it very seriously, but she herself as always, I mean, you yourself, actually, this we are conversing. You yourself had put more effort than minimally necessary. In another way, we both seek each other, you know, which is one of the pleasure for me to come back that I have friends in Colorado Spring. Well, you know, Eiko, my gift in your return every other year has been, um, to, to cultivate that friendship, but also to watch your work um, develop after a long, um, <laughs> long history of performing with Coma. Yeah. Then beginning um, this journey on your own, on your solo work and your teaching. So we often, yeah. uh, and particularly, I found like we came together because you were doing. Um, site-specific or site-based work. Yes. And for those who've, uh, who may be listening, I might have to say a little bit of what, what is site-based work. Mm -hmm. And there are many ways uh, that artists um, do this kind of work, but I think um, it's work that is happening often in uncontrolled spaces. And in Eiko's case, it would, um, your case, it was, the train station, but most notably um, 
at Fukushima after the um, meltdown of the, um, of the nuclear power plant there. And um, so site-based work often places an artist off, certainly off the stage, but often in uncontrolled spaces or contingent spaces, spaces we might not notice, or ECHO's series is called a body in places, and there are a range of places. So this is the, what we see on the screen here, ECHO can explain more, is a train station. And um, for me, it was such a heroic act that because you, you and Coma often performed in places other than the stage, but you really um, put yourself into a public situation as a soloist, you know, and that, that, that requires a certain amount of courage. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and, and we can certainly talk about that as well. But, um, but I, I'm interested to hear particularly about this place because it is a highly populated place. And it's also a place that people pass through. It's yeah. not, it, it's, it's a place to get somewhere else. It's not a place to like um, the cathedral where people go to worship or to pray or in Fukushima, where, which was devoid of any bodies except your own. But mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. you're in a crowd. Mm -hmm. but a crowd who has on their way somewhere else. Yeah. So it's Sean, is that okay? I'm actually opening this files up and you see the rest of it coming, but it will prepare yeah. me to see what's next. Is that okay? Looking yeah, this, this is okay. perfect. Okay, yeah. great. So this is Saki Street Station and, and uh, Philadelphia. And in fact, this was my first time I performed the solo. And it was actually a work that came to Egg and Coma, you know, from the producer, a museum director at this case, a work came to Egg and Coma. So then I ended up doing it alone because one, Coma had an injury. Two, we just finished our retrospective project, mm -hmm. which took four years. Mm -hmm. And we looked back, all the works we have made, I edited all the videos. We also made a new pieces. We had an, a career exhibitions. Egg and coma, egg and coma, egg and coma, every single day, making the book, you know, changing everything and correcting the fact. I was too much egg and coma. And it occurred to me, oh, do I, do I just be egg and coma? <laughs> so I took an opportunity to see if I can do this alone. And the coma was fine with it. And I expected the presenter to say no, because I was very aware. I was only known, if any, in a small circuit of the New York uh, downtown dance, it's a village, but as an and coma. But surprisingly, oh, why not, was an answer. So then, however, we dreamed too big to the point, it actually was a 12 hour performance. Oh, wow. So over four Fridays, right? So the first Friday we do 12 to 3 p.m. And then the next Friday, I pick where I left, 3 p.m. to 6, the third Friday, 6 to 9, fourth Friday, 9 p.m. to midnight. So I'm a Cinderella. I have to leave at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> so Koma said, you know, he came to all of it. And, you know, he was worried because it's a public place. And, you know, is it safe, et cetera. And then at the end, at some, some, somewhere in the middle of it, um, between, the, uh, between the performances, he said, you're not very humble. And I said, where does this come from? And then he said, your first solo show is 12 hours long. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it actually hit me. He doesn't talk to impress me to say something, you know, correct or uh, superb. But he, this one said, oh, I didn't even notice that. Right, because once I mean, command I have done directional performances, so yeah. I'm kind. You know, we did whole month long performances. And I I kind of undermined my anxiety level because I was talking as I am used to talking to the presenters and curators. So before I before I really gave lots of thoughts, 
I had signed up for to do 12 hour performance, you know, which was kind of funny. And of course I did it. And it was a big, big jump for me. I was very worried if I could, could do this. And most of the time, I, it was actually revealing. So this one was a performance and you can see people watching. Yeah. And nobody was supposed to sit there. But of course, people began to sit there. Course, and it was yeah. fun, right? And so by the time people sitting there, I was performing. I had audience. But this one, I put it there. This is a dress rehearsal. And I was actually shocked. Nobody was watching me. <laughs> and I was so used to on stage, if we appear in a museum, you know, the default setting is people to watch us. But in the public place, unless it is really produced that way, they, you know, people could ignore me. And that okay. was a shock to me. So, you know, I'm nothing other than just a strange human lying down in a station, right? So this almost humbled me to the point of, oh no, I have no really power to ask people to watch me. I just have to be much more persevering, much more okay that people can leave and people can come back, if any. People can think something else, but I'm still there for people. So it really made me a very different mindset as a performer than I was holding a place in, in theaters. It so, seems to me, you know, getting back to what Koma said about the 12 hour performance, yes. Uh, you know, so much has been made about you moving into your own solo work, mm -hmm. but in some ways, I see your site work is a duet with this place. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, in this case, 12 hours is the way that you become really acquainted to the space. You can never really be in rehearsal in isolation for the work. Yeah. Like, in the space it's even you said this is a rehearsal but yet it's not a rehearsal it's not a performance it's it's all you're always in in relationship with the space and with those in the space yes. whether they're watching yeah. you or not and you're absolutely right especially in the site work especially when it's <laughs> space people are there so even the people are ignoring they're sort of they know i'm there right uh, yeah, some people don't notice because they are so much in a hurry. But you are right. I needed this rehearsal, call rehearsal, space, time to really learn how people are, who they are, you know, the sense of destiny. Everybody is moving somewhere. And so I had to experience this and breathe in before I feel I actually have the sense of place that holds my body as a performer. And for this case, you know, doing a three hours was probably maximum that I don't have to worry about going to the bathroom, but I'm holding my place within an Araja station. But because I was so freaking out about the fact that I'm, I'm not performing with Koma, because here, if this was Ekon the Koma, if I'm here wrong, everybody's expecting Koma is coming from somewhere at certain point. <laughs> yeah. Right? But so so my being so it's different. Right, but so many of the people didn't uh, even know, you That's know, correct. That's Eiko correct. and Koma is. And in this performance, unlike some of your site works that happened later, uh, I think, I, I'm thinking about the performance on Wall Street or in the cathedral, um, there was an audience that was there just to see your work in that particular location. Correct. But I want to jump to Fukushima. Yes. Because I, I got my chronology mixed up. I thought the the train station was after Fukushima, but it was actually before. Yeah, well, the reason I put it two photos before was because it is in order to do my Philadelphia performance, I was really thinking, oh, if I don't have a coma, who am I? And what do I bring something, yeah. right? So it is in that planning, Philadelphia made me realize what's, 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 what's something that I can bring that people don't know from Philadelphia. And I literally thought, I remembered 
because I was already in Fukushima in 2011, uh, five months after the nuclear uh, meltdowns happened. And I, I was there only with my friend just to see what's going on because I really wanted to see and feel it myself. Um, yeah, really a nuclear disaster. And of course we could only go to the area we could go. There was a huge area that we cannot get in. And it is by thinking about Philadelphia, part of me as an immigrant, as a foreigner, not to make, oh, this is such a beautiful station, oh, this is a historical architecture, therefore I perform. That is not me. Right. So even though that beautiful, so-called beautiful, so-called grandiose, amazing big things is presented to me, I felt like I don't want to be like singing how America is beautiful, how this station is fantastic. That's just not what I do. So by bringing Fukushima, in order to bring Fukushima, I actually made a special trip to Fukushima. And this is 2014, uh, January. So this, you know, and the photo I showed you here, that was in November. So we actually took, you know, like 10 months after I've been to Fukushima, you know, because all the invitation comes about a year earlier or more. So it took me to really breathe Fukushima. This is also a station. So mm -hmm. I'm really putting two stations almost opposite of the end, crowded, beautiful, mm. grand, yeah. two yeah. totally broken, no train, no people, uh, everything is broken down. This is 2014, three years later after the nuclear meltdowns and nothing had been, you know, corrected, right? Mm -hmm. Because of radiation, right? So putting my body there, I was trying to remember something so different than Philadelphia station. And even that wasn't enough. So I actually went back for the same summer and even went further into the areas that is more radiated. So those you can see is the radiated garbage. Yes, you actually returned three times, is that right? Yeah, um, um, before the Philadelphia station twice. Uh -huh. and it was enough for me to bring to the Fukushima photograph, have an exhibition alongside of the Philadelphia station's performance. So people could actually make a connection. And in fact, the costume I was wearing in my site work is often the same costume, often the same red cross I also use in Fukushima. So it's easy for people to feel the connection. Oh, this is the same person whose photo is in the museum having the Fukushima show. So here I'm using my body as a conduit. Yes. Oh, Eko is here in Philadelphia. Oh, Eko was in Fukushima. Right. Why, why she went? Why she's performing here? Right. So those are the little questions that kind of comes up without being necessarily planted because it is clearly the same body, right? You know, this raises another conversation that we've had about our artistic work and activism. Mm -hmm. And because clearly um, the photographs, and we should mention that the photographs and in, in the Fukushima work that um, A Body in Places um, is done by William Johnston, who is yes. a collaborator. I'm supposed to say that, thank you. <laughs> so good. <laughs> yeah, and, and an amazing photographer and a history professor at Wesleyan where you also teach. Yes. Um, but, um, Around this time, you were coming to Colorado College. Yes. You know, and so we were witnessing this, and you were sharing this work with our students. And I remember you um, were in conversation with an environmental activist who came to visit Marta Kern. Yes. And um, she wanted your work to be more explicitly activist, mm -hmm. and you pushed against that. Yeah, and, and and talked about um, the very. Um, I don't know that I want to use personal, but nothing else is coming to mind. The very personal nature of regrets that you had mm -hmm. of, from yeah. your generation. Yeah. So I thought I thought if you could articulate that again in our yeah. uh, for those who might be listening later, I I just thought it was very powerful way yeah. to think of what the role of an artist when there is crisis or trauma or catastrophe. Right. And you know, I 
your mother is our common friend and you know she she bases in Boulder, Colorado, and she's been largely responsible for bringing Ekan Dukuma's early works to Colorado, to the Colorado Dance Festival. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she's a very good friend. I totally respect her devotion, you know, to the environment mm -hmm. and the ways yeah. that she wants to be very explicit about it. However, as me as an artist, you know, I'm, I don't mind being explicit when I go to demonstration. You know, I would be happy to carry the placard. You know, I, would, I want to be as explicit as possible. We, we should mention here that we did March in the Black Lives Matter. Yeah, together, March, together, right. And but, March, and, and, yeah. Yeah, and you and I but, were there together in the March. But yeah. you know, in the art event, sometimes people have a tendency if it's too explicit, they get it and then they leave. So get it, I think, is a very dangerous feeling, right? Mm -hmm. So if you yeah. say, like, I'm going to show you the next photo, I only to come back. Like here, yeah. if this woman who is a pass, you know, who is just a passersby and I'm coming into my performance, this is in New York. But if I have a whole note onto my costume, here I perform <laughs> in order to do this, she gets it. So no yeah. mystery and no questions. So she gets it, she sees it, and she leaves. But here in her expression is like, what is she doing? What is on? And I really feel it's part of the artist. Not everybody has to be this way. But to me, also in teaching, also myself as an audience or a leader, when I get it myself, rather than I get it because I read something. Yeah. I take a special ownership to my own understanding it. Yes. And if yes. that being so too explicit on my, before I even put my own thinking, then I don't have enough time to click to my mind. And to me, it's more important rather than just how many things you get it, you forget. But if you get it after thinking, after grappling, it could stay in your body. And that's one of the reasons why I have this discussion all the time with my photograph collaborator. I'm always going between, yes, I don't want to hide my motivation, yet I don't want to say, this is all what I'm trying to think. You know, I want to be between. I want to be not stingy, about sharing my motivation. At the same time, I don't want this to be all about it. I want to take these things away. And in here, if I don't say, the question is why she's in front of the garbage. Of course, we say Fukushima. So, you know, it's easy to look up Fukushima, what has happened. It's very easy to feel the radiation if you kind of know my simple program note, exhibition note will tell. This is the radiated place. But in Fitch, I'm saying no. This is my no, no dance, right? I'm like agitated. Like my body is not embracing, not licking, not kissing. Because all those houses, all those tires, all those garbages were made by our generation. It's not by 18 years old. It's not by 13 years old. It's not by right. five years old, you know? So in a way, we are the main part of our society whose our contemporaries are making all those things, combination of everything that has happened. Somebody much older than me, you know, nuclear has been developed for some time ago. But I feel if, if I'm willing to, to talk to you like now, I'm very willing to talk to you, but I don't want to put recording and put it all over the place all the time. I want enough to be there that people can think on their own, and even perhaps uh, motivated to even do the Wikipedia or do the internet search. Because when you search it on your own, it sticks more. Yes. But you know, there's two things that come to mind from, the, fr from our past conversations and things you've just said now. One is, um, I felt in that moment um, in the classroom, what you were saying to the students was your, these are my regrets and yes. I'm sharing them with you. 
Yes. But as an artist, you're there to find what your burning issues are mm -hmm. as an artist to find it might not be the environment, it might be racial justice, or it might be something else. But the, the other thought I wanted to share is to go back to that um, photograph with you and the woman in the pink shirt. Um, yeah, because what's so interesting about that photograph to me is unlike what you were saying that happened often in the train station where people didn't even notice you, she uh, leaned in. <laughs> she really leaned in and her attention is really present with you you know there's like you say a, a, a perhaps an expression of what you know what is this but she didn't move away from it she went into it right and that that was the other thing that you mentioned when I said that um your your work in um with in different places was a duet with the place, but you also talked about these kind of momentary duets that happened with people who, who you would never encounter. That's correct. Unless you, were, you, unless you were performing. And I just thought that was a beautiful evocation of duet, you know, or in, in relationship, even if it's for five seconds. Right, you know? and you know, even if she didn't come in to see my most of the, the performance, in this photo, and you know, Bill took this photo too, I can imagine she would remember me. Yes. You know, she would, I, I, maybe, I don't know how long, but like that night, she may even talk to her family. You know, I saw this weird person, you know, near that, 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 right? <laughs> and I kind of feel that's part of my job, not necessarily only talking about the Fukushima, but to create some strange time and space, like a little pocket of the time that is not the same as our everyday life, mm -hmm. right? So she brushes her teeth, you know, she counts her money, she makes sure that she has everything she needs for the day, she does her job, you know, she shops, she goes home, you know, help her uh, child uh, homework. But in this point, she's not having those, all those things she has to do for today. It's just a moment of what's that? And I feel that what's that is a very important way to recognize there's a different time and space mm -hmm. that can that can present. However little time, I, I feel that is so like, as the performance progress, now of course I get an audience and now this is in the Fulton Center. This is the closest station near the uh, trade center, you know, that was mm -hmm. of course uh, fell down. And, I didn't like this place. There's nothing beautiful in the place. So I told the presenters, uh, River to River Festival, I don't want to do it here unless you stop all the publicity because everywhere there's a very big uh, uh, billboard. And they couldn't stop the billboard, but they did say, this is the uh, most subway crosses here, stops here, so many subway stops here. This has been built, totally destroyed and rebuilt after 9-11. Mm. Took a long time. And my event here is the first art event. So it was only when I was told that, you know, part of me as a performing artist, we do things and we disappear, right? It's the performing art is very ephemeral, right? But as ephemeral as they are, I'm also aware certain memories, certain fact remains, right? So uh, Eco performed here. Next summer, other people did show. Next summer. So we are also part of the way that as a citizen and as an artist, we are part of the history. Mm -hmm. So that was my deep sense of, it doesn't have to be the most interesting architecture. It doesn't have to be the most great place. If I am aware, of somewhat we are part of the history. Site work can stand on that. So it's yeah. not always a visual, you know, design of the space. Yeah, in some ways, I, I, I saw your performance on Wall Street. I, yeah, I surprised you, I showed up on Wall Street. I think you showed up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and 
you know, I, I was very interested in how your your body in that place was very transgressive in a certain yeah. way. Yeah. And and in those more kind of um, commercial spaces, clean spaces, less contingent spaces like um, Fukushima after the meltdown. Um, you you know your strategies have to be different, right? And, and I found I had never seen you move so forcefully, and <laughs> so much it, it, you just big movement. You know <laughs> you know the, because I it, you know the, you were in on Wall Street. You know right. the, the heart um, heartbeat of capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is all presented by Roa Manhattan Cultural Council, which produces the annual River to River Festival. You know, it's Roa Manhattan, so East River and Hudson River. So it's River to River, which is how the Roa Manhattan is, is seen in the map of the Manhattan, right? right? So I've been working with this organization. I also performed in uh, Governor's Island, which is also the part of the LMCC uh, 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 cultural reign. And I was given that particular year, I was given a choice between either I can perform in a city hall or Wall Street. City hall is so much easier for me in a way to make an impressive performance because of architecture. And right. you know, the way that I can go into this hall and you know, I can do many things, right? And I have been doing the site work with Coma too sometimes, so I, I, I could do it. But there is realized Wall Street. The name stands for this, you know, <laughs> yeah. crazy. Name stands for the capitalism. Name stands for the history of Manhattan being the world capital of the capitalism, right? Yeah. So to me, it's like, you know, my father, my father was a communist who worked in a bank, right? It's already so much in my history that our our antagonism to the capitalism has never been so materialized, right? Even my father, you know, grudgingly has worked in a bank, commercial bank. So I kind of thought, even though I can't really make good looking show using the site smartly, I felt like I'm, I don't need to be smart. I'm actually pretty prideful. The world had so many smart people and, and see where we got. So I have a certain way, you know, I don't necessarily want to be stupid for being stupid, but I don't want to be the smart because being smart got us here. So a certain way I kind of feel like, okay, I can be rambunctious. I can be unreasonable because mm -hmm. the world is unreasonable. But I don't want to be same the way the world is. And I want to create my own unreasonableness that doesn't hurt people. But it creates a different pocket of time. So this <laughs> is what I'm doing. I'm carrying all those things to make my body bigger. Because there are so many <laughs> Chinese, Chinese tourists there. If I'm just standing so quietly moving, I totally mingle among the, among the uh, tourists, right? So I'm making myself almost a little, little act of uh, 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 aggression, a uh, little act of um, emphasis. What yeah. this place is, you know? Yes, it was so interesting because there were really four different kinds or more of audiences. There were the tourists, there were the professionals that were coming in and out of the buildings. There were... Um, the security guards and all the it was highly um, policed for yes. for especially for, yeah because uh, uh, <laughs> yeah yeah there we go it was highly policed and then there was an audience your audience following you throughout the the your journey on on this street right and so it was such a it was it really disturbed the space in a, a very powerful way. And as you say, not causing any harm or it was more, um, it's more than mischief, mischievous. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So there, was, there was a guy who was actually being a little bit of a guide to the tourists. I don't know why he was there. He had a, a sort of a, a strange uh, uh, bulky uh, wear. 
And then at one point when I was rehearsing, he goes, it's okay, it's okay. She's not crazy. She's an artist. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, no. <laughs> it was like really funny, but I think that's what he figured out. You know, he figured out, he's talking about himself. She's not crazy. She's because I would greet to him after the rehearsal and they would talk about, you know, weathers and politics yeah. and their, their memory of the 9-11, et cetera. So she's like telling people, she's not crazy. She's an artist. <laughs> and I was like, literally, you know, had a smile. But even here, as you can see, there are people who is looking at me and there are people who is totally not looking at me. And I cannot quite tell you if they are actually aware and ignoring me or even not aware. But then there are people, this woman, who is literally looking at me and I am looking at her. So there is that one moment of recovery. Yes, yes. And, uh, and I think, Eiko, this might be a good time to transition into um, the duet that yes. you, relationships you have with the cemetery piece. Do you have a, or, Yes, let me go. Cemetery, 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 cemetery. Yes, yeah. Yes, because so much of this earlier site work and we skipped over some. Um, That's some fine, fine. It's only there to be skipped. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, but just this past year during COVID, you did this performance in the cemetery in New York. Yeah. And the, I felt like you were communing with the dead when I watched the video and and preparing for your own death yes. in a certain way. And I had this, this notion of preparation was really interesting to me because you had talked about it yesterday and how you think of rehearsal in sight work as not rehearsals in the way we traditionally think of rehearsals as artists, but as preparation. Right. It's your own um, body coming to terms with the space and learning the space and knowing the space and, and the ghosts in the space. And literally, this is a quite ghosted space. That, in, that is correct. And this is 570,000 bodies is in you know, Greenwood Cemetery. It's huge. And it's second uh, oldest cemetery in New York. So you would think everybody there it's a long time ago. No, no, it's actually there are new graves and there are more new graves because of the pandemic as well, right? Yeah. So this photo shows that I'm, I have a very slow approach. So I'm literally like a little rice grain at the beginning. And as audience is gathering social distance observed, you know, because this is in the pandemic. And there was only two performances I had in 2020. So I have this very slow approach. And then I end up, you know, being seen by the people who are sitting, you know, pretty roomy in a place. But as you can see, sometimes my distance to the audience is much bigger than my distance to other graves. So the graves are much closer as even approach to the audience. I am being watched by those graves, right? Mm -hmm. Individual graves or, mm -hmm. you know, or else. And then as I can told you, there's a new graves with a new flowers. And, you know, the day before that, I was, the day before that and the day before that again, you know, people are digging new graves and, you know, more bodies came in. So it's a very much active 2020, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in not every death is COVID, but every death is related in a way how the hospital had been, you know, so packed up and, you know, the people really couldn't see their uh, families, you know, at the end. So it's a very traumatic year to lose their family because, they cannot be the center of the story because COVID is going all over the place. So, you know, you could lose your family member, but that becomes a, one of many, many, many deaths, right? Which I really thought about. But then we look at each graves and then we could imagine each grave has a special person, right? So I kind of call this twin graves and I performed around it. Mm -hmm. I also got um, a new dirt. So by the time I got a new dirt, it is as if like I am actually creating my own graves. Yes. So yeah. in, in a way, being so among the 
bed makes me know where somebody is next. And it could easily be me, or it could be easily my friend. And I, it, it was a very immersive experience of being with so many graves and so many history and what makes, what constitute of the graves, right? In terms of the land, immediately I became aware of the people who died without graves, right? So we only look, we see the visible is the graves, but there's an invisible death that, that the grave didn't survive, or grave was never made. So I actually practiced it by, by not in the performance space only, I asked my photographer friend to work with me to really understand what, what the cemetery is mm -hmm. and how the time, you know, you can see some of the graves are already like tilted. It's already a part of the landscape. It's not as strongly standing as majestic, you know, right. like namesake. And to, to understand how each of us becomes, perhaps some of us have a grave, some of us don't, but we end up being a part of the landscape, you know? <laughs> this photo clearly is like, I was quite touched and moved by seeing the graves would be buried at certain point, you know? Everything we create is not forever, right? Every monumental we create would not be standing there forever, much the same way everything we create as tools and machines will also break. So I'm trying to also understand this particular place, what is the relationship to Manhattan? What is the relationship to time, mm -hmm. sun, and the results? So I did a, quite a bit of work on my own to prepare myself so I'm not a stranger to the, to the, gray, uh, to the cemetery and only I came only to perform for the audience. I, it was important for me to put my bodies in layered ways of different places within the cemetery. So I feel like, I know a little bit more about this cemetery. So welcome, thank you for coming. I'm dancing for you, but I'm also have been dancing, you know, for the dead. So my body is among the dead. So this kind of shows my preparation. Yes, and for there's something that struck me about your preparation that I, I thought was exquisite really in, in the way, not in the way, um, you know, the Wall Street performance or some of, in the train station, there's a kind of um, transgressiveness. Yeah, I was this, yeah. You feel so like you belong in the space to me, you know, and that the relation, and there's one place on the video, which we don't see in the photographs, where you're pouring water along. Yeah. Yeah. The gravestones, yeah. and I almost see you as the caregiver for the dead. Yeah, because so. that's the custom in Japan. Whenever we go to the grave, you know, to 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 see our family member, we tend to give the water, we tend to give food, we tend to give flowers, mm -hmm. right? So that was my natural impression. But in terms of not aggressive means. I was very clear because, you know, the preparation is also at the same time as Black Lives Matter were coming really strong, right? From spring on, even though we have had it for as long as America's history is. But of course, you know, 2020 is a very big height of the movement, right? So I myself was very uh, aggravated. You know, my friends aggravated, you know, we were angry, right? But yeah. what's the point of bringing anger to the cemetery. And I really made a point of, okay, I can be as angry as I want and I should be angry. But for this performance, I told, and I wrote it in a program note, I'm leaving my anger at the front gate. Mm. And I will try to, you know, because it's like if you are visiting your very sick family to the hospital, you don't want to talk very loud. You know, you also don't want to shake by the excitement. You want to have a certain way that you want to be comforting, not upsetting. And that's some of that, the people. That's that feeling of care that came across. Yeah, because somebody who are already there dead, they, they may have had a very upsetting life anyway. So you know, why do I bring that to them, right? But right. at the same time, I was very, I was thinking, I don't want to be this, 
I leave the anger and I'm not angry. I think it's important in a society yeah. to be angry. So I will pick up the anger as I leave the cemetery because right. I need that in the street. I need that for my work too, or even to make a, a opinion, right? But we don't have to be burning with that anger every time. I'm not in a cemetery. I, there was a very specific decision I made. Right. I think this might be a good segue, yeah. Eiko, to go to the video that we're going to share to close our talk, which yes, is ending. Yes. And I just want to um, say that um, about what we had talked about yesterday, we had talked about deaths that were agitated or good death. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think this question of dying versus death, dying being a verb, death being a noun. Yeah. Um, that, um, you know, what is, how do we die in a good way? How do we, you know, die? Uh, or what do we do to care for those who are dying in an agitated way? You know, right. because some people do suffer at the end. And right. so I, that, that, that is a very important thing for experienced many people during the pandemic. Yes. You know, because the death in the pandemic had changed whether you died in the COVID or not. It really changes the ways you know, we are experiencing it, right? Right. And you lost your mom and I lost my mom. So we are kind of talking about that too, right? Yes. But I love, I love living. So I've always been afraid I'm not ready to die. And I didn't want to not to be ready. So I began to think by performing and being watched and really feel like this amazing support and the gaze. It is almost like I'm practicing that transparent place, that a different place. So at one point I thought like, oh, as, as if I'm dying on stage. I'm, I'm living, I'm making many decisions, but uh, it was as if I'm practicing dying. That notion, I became even more strongly when I work with very young people. Mm. So you and I talk about the death, which might come either of you. We don't know, even though you are younger, it's not that hell of the difference. And we are both vulnerable in many ways. Sure. But when I'm working with 25 years old, when I'm working with 30 years old, and I've known those, my collaborators, young collaborators for quite a long time, I feel very clearly I want to die before them. Not that I want to die now, right? I feel right. like this is the order. And I, 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 it, it helps me to know I'm still living, loving living, but in a way, when I look at all my collaborators, younger collaborators, and my kids, uh, my student, you know, they're mm -hmm. like blossoming. And there's no way they should go before me. I know. And those things happen, you know, unfortunately, those things happen. Yes, they do. Right? And, if you and I, I, I want to, them to know, please try your best, that doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, one of the yes. ways is that I feel really good about, I go first. Not that I don't want to die, but I should go first before you. So by thinking about that, by dancing with the younger ones, I really became, oh, this is really good practice for me to accept. And they can help me the way I helped my mom mm. to die. Right. I think she felt, she, I'm pretty sure she didn't want to die, but she appreciated I was there with her. Yes. She appreciated, you know, she was a center of the attention. So in a sense, the, this footage is actually looking back. It is not my sons, but represent any of the young people that I work closely who can help me die. And then die, death becomes a common, common currency that we can be talking about. And we should mention uh, in the video, we'll see one of your young collaborators. Yes, Iris McLuhan is my very long time yeah. collaborator. In fact, usually they are my dramaturg, but this duet project is the first time we are publicly dancing and performing together. And even though we are so different by age, we've known each other. I mean, I knew them from since the time they were 18, which is a lot of years for somebody, you know, who is 32 years old or something like that. 
they are yes. early 30s. Yeah. So we are both celebrating how we cared each other, how we encountered, and how we literally, you know, not just like that, it's like, and we love each other, we respect each other, and in that, if I die, that's a very good death. And again, so, this is not to say I want to die anytime soon, but the recognizing okay. the richness that I have received from my young ones. This is, so it's a kind of thank you dance as much as them helping me dance. Uh, well, let's look at the video then. and this will be our closing for our yeah, conversation. So much I want to say it was a pleasure to Eiko, be with always, you. It was a pleasure to be with you. I'm always so inspired. So, thank and you. Melissa, I think you can play the, the video. Yeah.